This will be our 28th lesson in the book of Ephesians. Tonight we're going to be in verses 20 through 23 as we complete the second chapter. <coughs> you probably detected as we move along that the first few chapters are foundational in nature and uh, begin the fourth chapter he'll begin with the application with the it's called the application of it or how these things are lived out so what we're looking at now is what is lived out that's what we're looking at now what Paul has done he has shined the light of God on salvation itself. See? He's enabling us to see salvation itself cl clearer. People have used the word saved, salvation, in very loose ways. They haven't really intended to do so. I mean, I know this. We don't want to think evil of people. But there's much more to salvation than the average person, average Christian person has dared to imagine. And it's really always been this way. And so uh, as the church grew in the book of Acts, they advanced in what they heard and what they understood. Just what Peter said on the day of Pentecost is actually very profound itself. <laughs> but the next time he preached in Acts 3, he kind of elaborated a little bit more on it, and 5, he did a little more on it, and now all the way through history has been this way. Particularly the apostles, they have opened up things about salvation, not about man. Moses opened up things about man No one knew things about man. See, David knew things about man. So that's not like a great discovery. Like if you just discovered that you're basically in nature iniquitous, well, you just, people have known this for thousands of years. What to do about it, that's what they haven't, that's what they haven't known. So what God is, what God through Paul is showing us here is, what God's done about this situation that anyone that was informed knew it existed. That there was a distance between man and God. It was, we were not equal to the devil. We had downward propensities and anyone with insight knew this already. But they couldn't address it. So Paul tells us how he addressed it. By God, how God addressed it. It's, it's, it's anchored, all the answers are anchored in God himself. That, that's why how-to religion is its just wrong. That's all. It's just wrong. Enough can't be said about how wrong it is. It's an insult to God yeah. to tell people how they ought to do what God says to do. Yeah. Unless God said it. Yeah. It's an insult. What are people doing when they do this? There'd be no room for Christ or the Holy Spirit or anything else to work. Well, really, they're thinking about making money. Let's get right down to it. Yeah. Yeah. Making money and empire for themselves. There ought to be a mass burning of how-to books. You ought to burn them. Yeah. Get rid of them. Mm -hmm. Why? You need God more than you need books. Yeah. Amen. Now, to drive this point home, he's reminded us that God chose us before the foundation of the world. So why in the world would you go to somebody else to... Find out how you ought to do what God says to do. God chose you. And he, he chose you so you'd be holy and without blame before him in love. So you want to know how to do that? What man can tell you how to do that? Who's ever been able to codify that? 
holy and without blame before God. Every how-to book in the world and how-to plan in the world tells you how to do things better. That's not what God's looking for. He's looking for holy and blameless. So he's telling us that that's what God done, and he, he, he predestinated us to be sons, and he did it according to his own will. Notice how God is in this. God's grace abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, like salvation is a wise enterprise. God doesn't really need any help. Amen. Yeah, verse um, with these uh, self-help books that uh, make men rich here on this earth, they're not really trying to help anybody because if, no. if you really help somebody, well, then you couldn't make any money off of them anymore. No. But the, the help that we're getting from God is eternal. The That's things right. that we're storing up is eternal. <laughs> it's not making anybody rich here, but the things that, are, that, they're, that they're, try, they're selling are for here. Yeah. See, men can only come up with crutches and canes, yeah. Yeah. wheelchairs. <laughs> That's the best they can come up with. But you don't want that. Because of God doing things according to the good pleasure of his will, there's a means of forgiveness of sins. And a lot of people's problems are owing to the fact they don't know about forgiveness of sins. I would venture to say it's probably about 98%. Of all difficulties people wrestle with, professing Christians, it's right here. They don't know their sins are forgiven in Christ, but they are. It needs to be declared. Amen. Now, the purpose is God has predestinated that we should be to the praise of the glory of His grace. That in the end, when it's all over, we will be a, the redeemed will be a display of what God's kindness, mercy, and love can do. Look, look, yeah. look at here. Kindness, grace, and mercy can do. Look, that's what this is all about. So now we're in the uh, second chapter, verses 20 through 23. He's reminded us that the Jews and the Gentiles have been called together in Christ into one body. And they're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple in the Lord. In whom ye are also builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Now once again, this, <laughs> I'm... Uh, Amazed at how much is said in just a few words. But this is a lot. This is very lofty business here. I thank God for it. We're built, the, the Jews and the Gentiles in one body, are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, if you want to understand newness of life, you've got to know what its purpose is. It's just not so you'll live forever in kind of a blissful state. That will happen, but that's not really what this is all about. It's not so you'll get out of the frying pan. <laughs> that's not what it's about. When we discuss the matter of newness of life, the first question to address is not, what should we be doing? That's not the first critical question. That you ask that to come in, what shall I do? But when you, this is, this, uh, you understand, brothers and sisters, that if this was seen, about 90% of all preaching would stop. Because almost all preaching is about what should we be doing. Almost 100% of it is staggering. But the question to be asked is, 
what is God doing in redemption? That's the question. Until that question is answered, no other questions should be asked. Because the answer to this question will spill over into it a phenomenal number of things. What is God doing in redemption? Now that's the matter that Paul is addressing here in our text. His message, what he says, and his methodology, how he goes about it, contradicts much of what's proclaimed in Christ's name, what has been proclaimed historically and what is being proclaimed contemporarily. Many professing Christians have never one time had an extended thought about what God is doing. Thought has never entered their mind. Why? Because this is what the, the people don't talk about this. Don't preach about this. But you, if you were to read the Bible with this in mind, what is God doing? <laughs> You'll find it on practically every page. It's there. You're built. See, the salvation of God is a building project. When you're saved, that word saved is a building project. That's what God is doing. Jesus said, and the building is being done by deity. Jesus said, I will build my church. If there's any question about this building project, Jesus said, I will build my church. Now, he does employ other people, men, some of which are called master builders. Paul was a chief of these. He says, I'm a wise master builder. I know how to build on Christ. I can tell you by personal experience and knowledge that a great number of professing preachers and teachers do not know how to build. You can tell by what they've done. You can tell by the results they've yielded. Now, why they don't know, that's we be charitable about it. There's really no excuse for it. All the information has been given. Wise master builder. That is, this, build, this building project is under divine scrutiny. What we to end up with has already been determined. Whatever doesn't end up like God wanted to end up is going in the scrap heap of humanity. There's no way a building that isn't like the one God wanted is going to end up in the glory. <clears throat> now, a wise builder, he lays down on the foundation the appropriate materials. The materials which are people have got to blend with the foundation. <clears throat> The foundation can't be of one thing and the, what's built on it of something else. Whatever's built on Jesus has to have a divine nature. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Partakers of the divine nature. It has to integrate with the foundation. See, in an earthly building, you can separate the building from the foundation. You can take the building off the foundation and raise it off and start again but this can't be done what's been properly laid on the foundation can't be separated from it because it's integrated with it this foundation and the cornerstone and the foundation are living and so are the stones that are built that's right mm -hmm. that's right yeah the integration isn't like a, a one time thing it's it begins but it's an ongoing process. It should be able to be reasoned out that if God's main purpose was to just get us out of trouble or to make us healthier, yeah. wealthy, then Satan would have never been allowed to enter that garden. I mean, they had it all right there. It's if, right. if that's what his goal was. It's but right. you see this building project, it required a certain 
certain things to happen for 4,000 yes, years. Right. He worked with man yes, right. before he ever sent a son. That's yes, right. In order that we might perceive what you're talking about now. Yeah. See, yeah. the church, which is the building project, is being built in the land that's going to be destroyed. Amen. Just like Noah built the ark and the world is going to be destroyed. <laughs> he built it in the devil's territory. Who but God can do this? You are told to beware of the devil. You get in his territory, he'll bring you down. But if God's building in this world, he's building in Satan's territory. When we say built upon the foundation, those phrases were built upon the foundation. We are built upon the foundation. That's the same as saying added to the Lord. That's Acts 5.14. It's the same thing as saying joined unto the Lord. That's 1 Corinthians 6.17. It's the same thing as saying we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bone. That's Ephesians 5.30. This is a collective way of viewing those who are in Christ and in whom Christ dwells by faith. They're built on the foundation. They're not like laid on the foundation. Yeah. They're built. Notice how it says built upon the foundation. <laughs> Not the foundation's laid. Yeah. The building's built. Yeah. Foundation wasn't built. Mm -hmm. Jesus was declared to be the foundation. Mm -hmm. He wasn't built. Yeah. <laughs> but the building is. It's what the Lord now is doing. He's building on this foundation. The point of our expression is not our unity with Christ, but is rather the outcome of the unity. The building isn't the point. What is being built, the end of the thing is the point. Yeah. It isn't just that, the, that you are active and doing something and the activity is good. The activity has got to end up like God has determined. That itself was quite an arresting thought because a lot of people never think about that. They just think about today. Religious people talk about it. They just think about today. Now, how it'll end up. Now, what exactly is the foundation of the apostles and the prophets? The prophets identified the, the one who was going to come so that when he came, people would know who he was. So they told about all sorts of prophecies about the coming Christ. The apostles, they proclaimed that Jesus of Nazareth was that one. Jesus of Nazareth, the person that people, everybody knew who he was in the flesh. See, any Jesus that is not like what the prophets said and what the apostles expounded is another Jesus. It's not, it's, it's not even a real Jesus. That's a very important to see. You're built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now, individual advancement is necessary. You, you've got to grow. But that's not the point of this text. The point of this text is not individual growth. It's collective growth. The building's what grows. Whole building. I don't know of many people, I don't know of any people. <laughs> Let me think of, for sure I'm saying the right thing here, but I, was, I cannot recall any person that I know of that is preaching that emphasizes how the whole body is to grow. Growth always means numbers, people. But we're talking about this whole collective was, was built on the foundation. It's, the, it's not one, 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 one. It's the whole thing, all the body integrated with Christ. Because it's integrated with Christ, they're integrated with one another. Now, at this point, building, the word edification comes into play here. 
edifice, you should figure it out, that it edification is building up. Building up of what? Me building up you? Well, edify one another, that is true. But in this text here, he's talking about the whole body being edified. So if we're speaking, five people are built up and 20 aren't, we, we haven't done the work. The whole thing has to be built up. We are built on the foundation. We, collective. And edification has to do with solidifying the structure, the whole thing. Is there any one person in the whole world that will dare to say that the church is strong? Does anybody with any kind of insight, will they say this, that the church is wrong, is strong? It's universally known and has been for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, that the church as a whole is weak. Everybody knows it. Some people have spoken extensively about it because of a great weight of concern to them. Weak churches, they're all around us. They're almost, it, you can go to one just close to where you live. You can find one, any place, every place, they're everywhere. But the existence of a weak church contradicts what God is doing. Okay, what about if it's a young church? Well, it won't stay weak long. Not long. It grew up quick. So I want, did, Paul is laying down a serious, a serious proposition here. Yeah. That the purpose of God is to build, have people built on the foundation that the prophets foretold and the apostles expounded, Jesus Christ, and to be strong. The church has got to be able to withstand yeah. attacks against it. Jesus said, I will build my church. Does anyone care to postulate that Jesus has built a flimsy, weak church? Is there anyone that would dare, that would dare to say such a thing? Surely not. That's exactly right. Uh -huh. So then this, the inevitable conclusion is, if there's a weak church, it's not something Jesus built. Mr. Barber. In addition to being strong and being able to be fortified against attack, the strong church will not allow infiltrations That's right. into it either. That's right. Amen. It's a bulwark because its, it's job is to declare the truth. It's a pillar and ground of the truth. And the truth cannot be on a shifty build, in a shifty building or foundation. So they must be built. The church is being built on the foundation, being constructed, being fortified, being completed. <clears throat> so at the point you get off Christ, or Christ is not the point, or he's not the reason why you're saying what you say, there's no work being done on the building. Amen. Amen. It's the way it is. The cell, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. So in the kingdom of God, the foundation is not a set of words. It's not a creed. It's not a position or a doctrinal summation. It's not what the foundation is. It's a person. Amen. Jesus Christ. The foundational consideration is he's the son of God. That's the most concise view of Christ. The most concise view of Christ is Son of God. Now, he's a lot of other things, but they're under that, yes. under that heading. The perception that Jesus is the Son of God, in other words, God couldn't deal with us personally. Uh -huh. yeah. <coughs> Too big of a gap between us. So his Son became like us so he could save us. When we say son of God, that's in that. That's that's in that, see. Son of God. Behind this phrase, the son of God, is the fact that Jesus is the only man that has God's 
unwavering and full approval. Amen. No other man does. He's the only one who has met all of the requirements and has fully addressed all the challenges. Son of God. <laughs> Salvation is the appointed means of being identified with the man, Christ Jesus. <laughs> As a salvation is. Salvation isn't just get you out. Salvation is get you in. So how can you become a part of this foundation? That's what salvation, that's what salvation is all about. Yeah. So you know, which is why when you said in the beginning, it makes it a process. That's it makes right. it something that's a continual thing. Because who would say, well, I came into the kingdom and I have everything? No, you're growing the grace right. and knowledge of the Lord. And, it, and it's, a, it's a steady. Mm -hmm. the king, if a person is conducting themselves as God intended, there's a steady growth upward. Yeah. Amen. There's more of the flesh falling off, more of the spirit being attained. When this process is slowed down, the only legitimate reason it could be slowed down would be trials, where, where the point would be under trial to stand. That'd be the, the point in trial is not grow. You don't grow in trials, as, not normally at any rate, not normally. You stand, but then after the trial, I would say that there is a spurt of growth. Yes? We said it earlier, but it's remarkable to, to ponder it that the, the building's alive Mm -hmm. And it grows by each member, <laughs> each mem part of the building grows. Right. Yeah. So, uh, it is that this member grows see. and this member doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you grow together. The whole grows. It's yeah. an integrated, it's an integrated mm -hmm. building, which is going to be developed fully in the fourth chapter. It's an integrated building, so they, they grow together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How could the building grow if just one one block was growing? But if you had a bank building down here and one brick started growing and the others didn't, what would it do? <laughs> the building had collapsed. That's what had happened. There are people that think this is the body of Christ. This actually happens. And it looks like it. If you look at it after the flesh, it looks like there's just a few strong bricks. But a few strong bricks can't keep the building up. So it grows together. The chief cornerstone, Jesus, he determines the dimensions and the size of the structure. It sets the tone by where it's, how it's going to end up. You know, when John saw the glorified church, he saw it as a perfect cube, a city four square. Nothing was out of proportion. <laughs> Here in this world, things that get out of proportion. You, know, you can start emphasizing the wrong thing or... But that, when, it's, when this project is finished, it's going to be a four square, a perfect cube, everything in perfect, absolute, perfect symmetry and proportion. That's where it's going. Now, whatever contributes to that purpose is of God. Whatever doesn't is of the devil and the flesh. Just that straightforward. See, a lot of times Christians have to overcome what they're subjected to. Yeah. That's not always easy. There'll be nothing in the glorified church that detracts from God. Now, while the building's in the process of being built, occasionally there'll be things that are distracting. <laughs> you would rather they didn't happen. But when it ends up, this isn't the way it's going to be. A wise master builder builds so these things are less apt to take place. The twofold reason for the ultimate outcome is declared in our text. Jesus is the foundation of chief cornerstone. And when it's completed, it, the body, what's on the foundation will in fact be a replicate of the foundation itself. That's where God's going with this. Built. Or we would say is building. Now he says that the in whom as in Christ who is the foundation with whom the building is integrated 
in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth all, all the building groweth I say all the building groweth into the holy temple in the Lord in whom of course refers to the Christ that the prophets foretold and the Christ that the apostles expounded that Christ <laughs> Now, any church work that doesn't take all the building into consideration is suspicious, to say the least. Yeah. Now, some, some church work just takes the corner bricks or the middle bricks or a couple of the bricks over here in the consideration. There may be times when there's a little bit of tough pointing that has to be done. We acknowledge that. But the, the purpose has got to be the whole church. All right? Like, who do you know that's interested in the whole church growing up together? Are there... The world isn't without people like this. This is a rhetorical question. What I'm pointing out is you do have to do some thinking about it, though, don't you? You have to do some thinking. Let's see, who, who, do, who do I know that's interested in the whole? You see, there's some people interested in the youth. Some people are interested in the single folk. Some people are interested in the married folk. What about the whole building? in which there isn't such a thing as all of these. We're all one in Christ. No people group or domestic group or supposed specialty group can forget about all the building. All right, now let me give you an illustration that is happening here among us. We've got some separate meetings I'll take, for instance, the young people that Brother Jonathan and Sister Maddie are working with. But their products are fitting into the whole building. That's right. See? <laughs> when they get done, you've got young people that can be part of the building. Amen. They participate. Mm -hmm. They contribute. Part of the building. We've got men meet together. The outcome of this is we participate with the, the whole building is advantaged by what we see. The ladies meet together. The whole building is participates in what they see. Yeah. All the building is fitly framed together. <coughs> fitly framed is stated in a number of ways in the various versions. The New King James Version says being joined together like, like a puzzle. The New American Standard says being fitted together. That is, somebody else put them together. Rightly joined together. The basic Bible, it says, rightly joined together. So that's correct. It's correct. Coupled together. The Geneva Bible, I like that. Coupled together. Held together. The New American Bible. Carefully joined together. That's just a thoughtful process, fitted and closely joined together, harmoniously fitted together. The Message Bible says, holds all the parts together. <coughs> now, fitly framed together results from being in Christ. I prefer fitly framed, joined together, coupled together. I prefer those to held together. Now, have you ever done puzzle work with your children? You you got a picture on the box. Tells you what it's going to be. The older you get, the more pieces you got to put together. The little children have five or six pieces, so that's about all they can do. But uh, they got the picture on there. This is what you got to end up with. And all the pieces, you got, and you, most generally people work on the borders first, you know. All right, this is how the church is built. It gives you a picture of what you're going to end up with. Holy and unblameable yeah. in this sight. You get this picture. 
Then the each one of us are like an individual piece of the puzzle. We're coupled together. If you get down to it, you're coupled with the right people. Think of your marriage as being coupled <laughs> together. Then the pieces are, you have a wall over here is framed by people being fit together. Your 12 apostles were fit together and formed like a prominent part of the building, fitly framed together. In the end, Christ actually does this. I will build my church. He takes the, takes the oh, I got a piece over here. It's way, man, I'm way down in Florida. <laughs> got to get them up here, fit them together up here. Well, I'm telling you the truth. This is the way it works. Some people are down and down in Georgia. They're not, they're, they're not fitting in. There's no, there's no kindred pieces down there. Got to break them over and fit them. Got to. This is what's happening, brother. Amen. Yes. So, Devin, in the in the framing of the, of a of a wall in a house, mm -hmm. everything from from the studs to what goes on the outside to the drywall on the inside mm -hmm. is real dependent on how they line up and stay together. <laughs> and so you can't, the studs just can't go wherever they want Amen. to and then you think the drywall is going to go on because it's not going to stay. Amen. So it's very important that they're fitted. Fit. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's a good word, isn't it? Fitly. Yeah. That's yeah. right. All actually fits the gear right. Every, every part of what's built there fits. It actually fits. Yeah, what if you what if you cut your two by four for a stud? You cut it this way, <laughs> it won't fit. <laughs> then you take a person they're like not fully devoted to the Lord. It's, it's that lopsided cut that <laughs> won't fit, won't fit. But see, if you stick with Christ, Christ, what Christ does in you will fit you, Amen. so you'll be able to fit. Fitly framed together. None of us could, could uh, profess that we that we were accepted in a, on our own. That's right. There wasn't anything about us that would even we, we we wouldn't even come to the conclusion that we even were made for that building. But he he's building he's the been, church. Yeah. He chose the pieces, and so he's the one. You think about it, the only way that you could have a building that grew together. Would be somebody that would have the power over all the elements of the building. <laughs> That's right, exactly right. The exactly best you can do, right. with, the best you can do with them miscut pieces is throw them over in the scrap pile, That's right. and you might be able to use it later on. You don't know. Might be, maybe it'll fit later on. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <Amen>. That's right. <laughs> fitly framed, fitly framed together. Now, actually, what we're working, what's being built, is, in technically speaking, the frame. What's in the house is going to be God, <laughs> right? Yeah, amen. And the furniture that's in the house now is the all things that pertain to life and godliness. So really what we are building is the what contains. Yeah. That's what we're building. It's the container. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's being built. <laughs> now, you know this already, but there are a few experiences that are as great and refreshing as knowing that you fit that you fit in. <laughs> now, I've always been a misfit. I've never been able to get in with the cliques from a young man. I was never, you know, we went to school at the cheerleading clique, the athletic clique, and the harebrained clique, and you had all kind of, I couldn't fit in very well. And then, but the disconcerting experience I had was I found I didn't fit in the church either. But when you find some place you actually fit in, it's something it does for your soul that only the persons that fit in know. But as a tremendous encourager, just to be part of something that's working, you know. And all over the world there are people like this. God has people all over the world that fit together fitly framed and it doesn't to be when you're fitly framed it doesn't make any difference how many of the you there are you notice that doesn't make any difference how many there are just the fitting together just makes up for a lot of the a lot of the things Amen. so a building in which the various parts don't fit together 
this isn't a building Jesus is building. Now Babylon's created a uh, spiritual monster where the parts are diverse from one another and they don't have to fit. You can take a handful of bricks and put them over here and we'll have the, this is what, why they have cell groups. You couldn't have cell groups where people fit together. They'd object, wait, wait, wait a minute. I don't want to be in some group over here where I miss out on brother, sister, so-and-so. For cell groups, the reason they had them was they couldn't get enough people out to the meeting. This is really why. So they, to keep the numbers up, they split them up and, well, I won't get off on that, but. Way. That's right. Pulls them together for a short period of time, so they can concoct these other meetings where they don't have to associate with each other. They can only associate with those with whom they agree and have some affinity yeah. outside of Christ. Mm -hmm. The way Babylon resolves people who don't fit in, they just cut them off. They send you a letter of notification. Some of us have received some of these letters of notification. I have Brother Dave and Sister Sue Kennedy received a letter of notification. But they didn't fit in. That's where they got it. Some people say, well, people who receive special training, these are the people that fit in. So they cut down on who says anything, who talks. They reduce this. Whereas God now, he's building a building where all of the individual members contribute. Yes. Well, this is disastrous to Babylon, so we just have the specially trained people to speak. Well, this is a situation where the people haven't been integrated with the foundation. You can take an 11-year-old boy, 13-year-old girl, and integrate them with the foundation, and they can edify the whole body. Or you can take an old person that the world says is worn out and they've discarded. He can benefit. He or she can benefit the body. See? Because they integrate with the foundation. The nature of the building makes, makes for this. So it's fitly framed together. And it grows. It grow, <laughs> this would be like a skyscraper you pass by it one one month and it has 12 stories and then all of a sudden it got 14 stories and then it has 20 stories it's a growing it says it grows into a holy temple How about that <laughs> not just a temple a holy temple in other words it it, in Babylon the Great, the building is not the point. For this reason, there's a lot of sloppy thinking about the foundation and about what put on the foundation. But here in Christ, the building is, a, this is the determination. It's a divine determination. It grows. If nobody quenches the spirit, nobody resists the Lord, no one denies Christ, they keep the faith. Here's what's going to happen. The whole building will grow up into a temple. Some versions read, into a holy house of God. Another version reads, a holy sanctuary. The Living Bible says, constantly growing, a constantly growing temple for God. And the Amplified says, continues to rise, grow, increase into the holy into a holy temple in the Lord's sanctuary, dedicated, consecrated, and, sta and sacred to the presence of the Lord. So God's going to move in this building. is being prepared for God it's not being prepared for men. It's being prepared for God. Yes, amen. It's not a haven of rest for the world. It's a building for God. Yes, amen. That's what it says, isn't it? Yeah. Grows in a holy temple of God. It's been mentioned in the past 
and um, you mentioned, Sister June's mentioned it, that a body is is something that a spirit can live in. And uh, in, in, in the right. largest sense of the word, right. God's making, Jesus is making this body for God. That's right. He's going to move in. He's going to be the one animated. Everything that's done from that point that's, on is going to be his purpose worked out that's right. through this body. Through this body, that's right. That's what this is for. The church is a place for God to inhabit. Yeah. That's, that's what it's designed mm -hmm. for. Overall, through all, and in you all. Yeah. You're right, amen. And that's why it continues to grow, is because it's showing yeah. the nature of the one who's going that's to right. Amen. Amen. It will continue to grow then. Mm -hmm. Pardon? It will continue to grow. Continue to grow. Yeah. Now, this is a concept that's virtually unknown in our time. I want hastily, it's not because people are like stubborn or ignorant or so forth, it's because this is not proclaimed, it's not generally proclaimed. Because a lot of people catch on to this right away as soon as they hear it. Unholy people in this temple are no more welcome than the money changers were in the first temple. Jesus said of the first temple, this is my father's house. Is that what he said? This is my father's house. My father's house, he says, shall be called a house of prayer. It has to do with, <laughs> with God. So here's a picture. The picture is that of a holy temple. It's under construction. Like the ancient temple was under construction when Solomon built it and was reconstructed when Zerubbabel built it. It was under construction. Now, even in the world, in under construction areas, some people are not allowed to be in the under construction area. Right? You're not allowed to be in there. Only only the ones working on the building, they can come in there. Yeah. Now, that's the way it is to this building. In the under construction area, nobody in the world's allowed in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just the ones that are contributing to the building, yeah. to the project itself. They're allowed in there. Holy Temple for the Lord. Now, just as if you just, if this dominates your thinking, you think, oh, yeah. As a group, we're being made so God can dwell among us here because when we're all together, he's going to dwell in us there. So we got to get used to God being among us Amen. and tailoring what we do with that in mind, yes. tailoring what we say with that in mind. Yes. When the church is seen as a holy temple under construction, it makes a significant difference in what people emphasize. Yes, amen. Now we're built together as he, for a habitation of God. That's all. Oh, that's a what a marvelous thought. This may sound like it's repetitious, but it's not. This is emphasis. God knows that because we have this treasure in earth and vessels, there's certain things that tend to kind of get a tend to get away from you because of where you are in the world and your body that is not of God, your body which is contrary to God. So this has to be reaffirmed because, because we're in a kind of a weakened condition right now. We want to think about God all the time, but we're not able to do so. There's another law in our members, warring against the law of our minds. So there's competing thoughts. And so how do you offset these competing thoughts? You reaffirm these stabilizing, yeah. uh -huh. <laughs> stabilizing thoughts built together for a habitation of God. The thought of Christ being both the hub and the environment, the hub and the environment of everything God does is so strange to human thought, it's got to be restated and re reaffirmed. In whom, in whom ye also are built together, that's Christ. If what is being done is not being wrought in Christ, it will not have the results that are now specified. The state of objective will not be realized then. The work is not being done by Christ, and the building is not on the foundation, the proper cornerstone has not been used. 
This is the unvarnished truth of the matter. If you've got something that's not being made more and more and more suitable for God, more and more and more, build it up for habitation of God. If this isn't happening, we've got a serious situation on our hands. We've got an imposter and enemies in the house. Build it together. Now, I like that language. We're joined with him and with one another. Any supposed church activity that does not involve the members being built together is, to say the least, off-center. There are people that have specialized ministries. How legitimate they are, that's open to debate. Say, are you against these things? No. It's just I haven't made up my mind about their legitimacy yet. I'm thinking on it. If God's got a live working together economy, then how come to get anything done, you gotta separate from Christian people? I just think on it once in a while and then I get off of it because it's kind of depressing. <laughs> but the average in the average American church, a person who's growing in the Lord distances himself from the other people. Have you found it to be so? Who hasn't found this to be so? As soon as you start to grow, there's a gap. You're not together. See, well, a growth that doesn't promote together, somebody's not in. <laughs> something's, something's wrong here. We're building together for habitation of God through the Spirit. Habitation of God, other versions call it dwelling place. In other words, he comes to stay. In a sense, he visits now. In a sense, it's a little clumsy, but but it, there, it, God Himself shall be with us, and so he, He'll never leave. In other words, so He's building a place He can come and stay. He visited the tabernacle. Glory came down, fill the house. Then there was a the mercy seat. Met him over the mercy seat once a year. <laughs> once a year. Once a year. Well, that's not something that satisfies God. He's looking for dwell, stay. So he's building a place where in the glory he can move in and not leave. Fill the tabernacle. Yeah, no man could. The ministers had to get out. <laughs> That's right. right. That's, That's right. right. Yeah. yeah, the legitimate ministers even had to get out. Yeah. Now here again, the thought radically will change a person's perception of the of the church. It's not placed here basically as a beacon to men. Now it is. It is a beacon to men. It is the light of the world. Make no mistake about it. That's not basically what it is. Basically, it's being prepared to be a habitation for God. Amen. <laughs> How can you exploit that? You can't exploit something like that. You can exploit being a beacon to the world. You can exploit, you can twist it around and make a career out of it. But how can you, you can't twist this other? <laughs> you, because this, even flesh knows if it's for basically for God, it's like it ties the hands of the flesh. Can't do anything. Get off that, build it together. You know, a lot. I've heard of a lot of expressions from the brethren here um, for a few years now that they've experienced special growth when we're together. Yeah. 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 And this is part of this being built it together. You know, there. It, it, you'll notice that at the renewals, where more people come, yeah. and it's yeah. because. They just don't sit there in the same room and something magically transfers. They say something. Yeah. Yeah. They express their faith. They, they, and so you can grow expo exponentially as, as to what the truth is, as expounded, as Christ is clarified, yeah. then you can grow together Amen. In, in a more precise Amen. manner. And it's not that we don't grow at home. I just, I just want to mean. It's just that, that we've all experienced this, that some, somebody's 
bring something up and you think you know a lot about it, but when you hear the brother and express their faith yeah. on it and you see it clear, now you do know more about it. Amen. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Now Paul gave an example to the Corinthians about the uh, effect of God being in the, in the assembly. I want to read some of that. 1 Corinthians 14, 23 through 25. If therefore the whole church be come together, all right, so there we're clear what we're talking about there. The whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues. And there come in those who are unlearned or unbelievers. Will they not say that you are mad? Because they don't understand anything. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Now here's how it works. Someone comes in, we don't know. Or we do know, and they're, but they're not in the household. So for some people, I say, well, I'm not going to say anything today because, you know. But instead, everybody speaks their heart and all right, now, God works through them and will address the condition of that person that is unknown to all of us. Or maybe it's a saint that comes in, visiting from someplace else. All the brethren begin to contribute, and working through the members, Christ builds up. That saint with things, it's, it'll sound to him like every, somebody told us all about their condition. Sometimes I've sat in the meeting, and I've wondered if Sister June didn't leak out some information about me. <laughs> I know she didn't. But it's that, it gets that personal. What is it? That's the working together. That's what that is. Now, that's the benefit men realize. But in heaven... The together environment does something for God in heaven. Amen. You know, when God's blessed, what happens, you know? <laughs> Amen. Benefits come down. Now, just now someone says, well, if this is really the truth, it's basically for God. What about reaching the lost? How's that going to be done? Well, I'm glad you asked. God, who has gave his son to reach the lost... <laughs> That's what, that's what salvation is all about, reaching the lost. Well, he obviously is not going to forget this. So as you're ministering to the Lord, yeah. habitation for God, church at Antioch, as they were ministering to the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas for the work whereunto I have called them. And they went to the lost. That's yeah. where they went. Paul's in Troas. They're ministering to the Lord, see, he sees a vision, a man over in Macedonia says, come over and help us. They gathered, well, the Lord's calling us to go over. And they went over there and they found several people. They didn't know Christ, they preached Christ. To See, if you, if you actually let God dwell among you, he'll orchestrate all of these other things so that they'll take place. So that answers this question, see. Some people say, well, you're just, we were charged in the end of being a worship society. A worship society. Well, thank you very much. That was the venerable Jack Hiles. He's went on to be with somebody, went with it, be with the Lord, I hope now. In a church at the time, it was 30,000. At the time, they had 30,000. It's 100,000 of 10 now. Hammond, Indiana, 100 thousand people attend one service every Lord's Day. See, how do they do it? They bought an apart a whole blocks of apartment buildings that have three floors in them, and every floor has these big screen TVs. And they've got a hundred thousand people that attend. So sometimes I say someone said, we had three thousand. I couldn't lend. Is that all you had? Don't even mention it.
So the, my point is that the early church, they knew they were for, basically for God, so they ministered to God. See, how do you minister to God? Well, you draw attention to what he's done, and you thank him for it. And this is a variety of ways to do this. It's hardly, it's, it's almost endless. Mm -hmm. And as you do this, then the Lord will direct you in building work. Yeah. Huh, right? Yeah. I close this by saying, a habitation of God through the Spirit. Just, just in case you may tend to overestimate yourself through the, by means of the Holy Spirit. That's how he inhabits the church now. In the world that comes, says God himself be with us. But now, God is with us through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is known as the Comforter. And he's someone who leads you, guides you into the truth. <laughs> and he's got, but God's, God's taking up his dwelling vicariously through the Spirit. So here, before we get to the glory, the church is intended to be a place where God dwells through the Spirit. And the final project, the building is going to be big enough for God himself to dwell in it. Amen. Now, I asked you, isn't that a, isn't that a wonderful, wonderful plan? Amen. <laughs> All right, any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? It's a matter of ministering to the Lord and then the work being done. The Master did say, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest yeah, that right. he will send forth. That's Maybe right. Huh? That's, that's right. right. Into his harvest. Yeah. Into his harvest. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's like you know, Brother Joe and Brother Bill hired me to manage and run the warehouse. They didn't hire me to sweep the floor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or to sort cars. Mm -hmm. Or any of those other things that all have to be done. Yeah. And those things get done. But that's not what I give my attention to. That's right. I give my attention to managing the work. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. Every man, he said he gave to every man his work. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. Everybody has a function. These are living stones. Yeah. Not dead bricks. <laughs> living stones. Amen. Yes, Brother Jim. You were talking about um, fitting in, and uh, I've seen in my life how the Lord has protected me from different times of not fitting in. Yeah. And, you know, here in this fellowship here, I'm blessed by brethren that we could come together and fit together, but only because of where we're going that we That's come good. together and fit, That's good. fit together. It's because of we're, we are made to fit there. And that's why we're drawn together. Yes, it doesn't right. matter what part of the world we're in. God, God is, I've noticed this, God draws his people together. Yeah. I mean, we, we have experienced now in this day people around the world who have uh, been attracted to us and we've been attracted to them. But it's because we don't fit here. We fit there. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yes, Brother Mike. This entire process is um, accomplished through the Spirit, and therefore it is, it's all a spiritual matter. Being mm -hmm. fitted together is a spiritual That's matter. Right. It's not done uh -huh. on the basis of, of fitting personalities uh -huh. together, uh -huh. or age groups, or gender, or uh -huh. um, economic status, or not, it has nothing at all to do with that. It's mm -hmm. all accomplished by the Spirit. The fitting, the growing mm -hmm. is done. Uh, it, it, it is a spiritual matter, and it's accomplished through the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. being built together. And uh, so, this is something that that Babylon can only try to um, emulate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And but the the only thing they have to work with though is the flesh. They try to duplicate what yeah. the, the Holy what looks like what the Holy Spirit is doing, but all they begin with and end with and work with is the flesh. So it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> there. At the beginning of creation, he breathed into Adam and filled his body. Yeah. And Amen. In Moses' day, he filled the tabernacle. Yeah. And then in Solomon's day, he filled the temple. Yeah. And now in Christ's day, he 
to building another. Yes. It's just like all, all three together. Amen. Amen. People, Amen. Mobile, <coughs> permanent structure, all, all together. Amen. 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 Very good. Amen. I think yes, as you, you were speaking, I was considering the, the necessity that it is to mm -hmm. be together because this is, this is where we do our growing. Things are cleared up mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and refined and sharpened. And mm -hmm. I, I was remembered, reminded of Apollos. Uh, before Priscilla and Aquila had come into contact with him, he had not yet heard mm -hmm. of the baptism. Mm -hmm. um, he, had, he had just heard of John's baptism, but not the Lord's. And, mm -hmm. um, but as soon as Priscilla and Aquila were able to minister to him the greater thing, he was able to then grow up with them mm -hmm. and, and then continue to proclaim the good things of the Lord. In a, in a greater measure. Amen. He became one of those master builders, too. Yeah. The clearer you see this, uh, the, the more obvious that you can see Satan is trying to do mm -hmm. what God is doing in the Spirit. He's trying to do the same thing in the flesh. That's mm -hmm. right. And the men who have bought into this, see, now they're left with this burden of trying to uh, mm -hmm. uh, produce unity in it. Mm -hmm. see, because <laughs> now if you're going to duplicate what God is doing, then Amen. we're fitted We're fitted for unity. But yeah. see, that's, that's where the hang-up is. And so they, they can't uh, they can't have unity. Yeah, they'll right. never have unity. Of course. That's right. Amen. Well, in um, 1978, you were preaching through the, uh, the book of the Revelation. One, well, it's either was, I think, the second time. Anyway, you met, you gave a testimony, and you said um, that a close friend of yours had told you that you would be a lot more successful in fitting in and being accepted by the denominations. If you would just stop talking so much about Babylon, <laughs> and um, but as I listened to this and uh, you developed the thought that um, you know if you had let's just say you had said well you know I I don't have to be so hard on people, but see I can see now that God raised you up and 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 as you preached through the through three different times that I have recorded that you preached through the Book of Revelation just like you became an an expert at, re, at, at God used you for this to draw people out of Babylon. So you got to know what Babylon is before you can ever yeah. draw anybody out. And anyway, the, this thing that's come out of her, my people, until you see that it's, until you see what it is, you don't even know you're there. Yeah. But see, God's raised yeah. up people, and they're, they're yeah. all over. I mean, God's raised these people up that can see what, what's in you and what, where you're at. And they can, God can use them to lead you out of a certain condition. And I can see that in this very assembly, our own, that we that we're, we're ministered to and, and are able to minister to others. Yeah. That God's given each of us an mm -hmm. ability. And you know, if you're growing, we're talking about the church growing together, the body growing yeah. together. That you have today, if you're growing, you have a stronger desire to please God. You have a greater Amen. inclination right. to bless the brethren. That's right. See, you, 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 you have a, a strong desire to crucify the flesh. Where did all this come from? This is because you're growing. You're growing. You're alive. And yeah. so, you Amen. know, this is it's not over yet. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here tonight. For me, it's not over yet, I, which means that I'm not, I still have more, but I don't know all of it, thank God. I know what I know today, and he'll give me grace to be able to progress. This is Without this, what really would, what would knowing God be Amen. if it wasn't Amen. growing together? Amen. And I thank God for um, way back then, Him <laughs> using you and others mm -hmm. in my life, in my own life, to, to be able to, because I look back and I think, I thought I know, knew so much, but I didn't know more as much as I thought I did. Yeah. And so God's, He's merciful. He's long-suffering. He's not willing that we perish, that we grow up into Him. And um, what a wonderful thing he's given us. Mm -hmm. Amen. See. Yeah, those, Amen. those three times through the book of Revelation, that was nine years of preaching. <laughs> Each time was a was an update, I'd see. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Brother Ricky? I'm thankful for those terms that God gives us that accentuates the, 
collective people of God as mm -hmm. a whole oh, yeah. Yeah. in our text, you know, building mm -hmm. and a holy temple, yeah. the body of Christ is one. Yeah. Of course, Family. when you get to the book of Revelation, this kind of terminology picks up. This is yes. like accentuated mm -hmm. in the book of Revelation, like she's the, the, church, was re the church is referred to as the woman. Mm -hmm. Yep. The bride. The bride has made herself <laughs> ready. Yeah. And then later on in the book of Revelation, he talks about the city of God yeah. coming down yeah. from heaven, having the glory of God. So see, in the end, yeah. the church's renown is what she is as a whole. Very good. Not what mm -hmm. she Very just good. is as individual members. Amen. And it seems Amen. to me, any legitimate work of God will have that in measure. Uh -huh. Amen. Yeah. In some uh -huh. sense, we are... We are showing forth the glory of God as a whole, mm -hmm. not just as individual members. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I know you have individual members. Mm -hmm. If Paul's in the assembly, obviously he's going to rise to the top. Yeah. You know, and you have that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you also have what? What is the entire body communicating as a whole? Yes. And I think one of the things that I love about the assembly we have here is the opportunity to speak mm -hmm. what you've seen, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. see, in our assembly, God is being glorified by what all the members are saying. Mm -hmm. In all different age brackets, mm -hmm. from all different backgrounds and things, but we have a we have one voice, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think that's bringing a lot Amen. of glory to the Lord. And God will fit it together. If you, yes. You'll, you'll yes. see it. This will happen quite a number mm -hmm. of times. People have whoever not conferred with one another will speak it at a given time, and it will all blend. Uh -huh. That's the sign that God's Jesus is building His church. Amen. He's doing this all over the world now. Yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer.